Today we'll be making Gordon Ramsay's legendary mushroom risotto with budget ingredients available at any Walmart. Risotto is the one dish that gives home cooks and contestants on Hell's Kitchen the most trouble, so we'll go over absolutely everything you need to know, from what type of rice to use to why you should splurge on nice butter. By the end of this video, you will be able to make a classic risotto that will take Gordon from this <laughs> to this. That is perfection. Now, I know Hell's Kitchen has traumatized an entire generation of home cooks from attempting risotto, but the dirty little secret of the fine dining world is that risotto is more afraid of you than you are of it. It's quite simple to prepare correctly, and it all starts with a very specific type of short grain rice. During the research for this video, I visited several different Walmarts to get a lay of the land, and I started to get a little worried after the first location because they didn't have risotto rice. But after scoping out a few more locations, I was relieved because they all had rice select arborio, which is precisely what we need. The reason we use short grain rice like arborio for risotto is that they're high in a starch called amylopectin. Through the long cooking process, this starch is gradually released into the broth where it emulsifies into the creamy sauce associated with good risotto. Long grain rice, on the other hand, tends to be low in this starch and therefore wouldn't give us that creamy consistency we're after. The second most crucial element of a good risotto is the broth. Ideally, you would use homemade stalker broth, and Walmart has everything you need to be able to make an incredible broth at home. But I'm trying to be practical here, and I realize most home cooks are not going to make a stalker broth from scratch just for a risotto. So my advice is to use a high quality broth base or bouillon cubes. Something like Better Than Bouillon is an absolute lifesaver and is actually a really good product that is used in high-end kitchens. And look, Marco Pierre White isn't going to get angry with you for using chicken bouillon cubes. But I'm a home cook now, not a professional cook. Nor will I. These concentrated broth and stock products tend to have much more flavor than their boxed or canned cousins, so I would advise for you to reach for them first. But if all you can find is boxed or canned broths, these are perfectly acceptable. For the mushrooms, we're going to use these canned psych. Got y'all, just making sure you're still paying attention. So a typical Walmart has three different varieties of mushrooms. White Button, Baby Bella, also known as Criminy, and Portabella. And any of them will work fine in this dish, but the Portabella tends to be the most flavorful because as the mushroom matures, it loses some of its water content and the flavor concentrates. And a fun fact, White Button, Baby Bella, and Portabella are all the exact same mushroom at different stages of its life. While immature, it can be either white or brown. And when the brown mushroom matures, it grows into a large portabella, which is just a marketing term. This is not a word invented by Italians, but by copywriters. With the three main elements out of the way, let's start on our mushrooms by adding a tablespoon of olive oil to a pan over medium-high heat. And I wholeheartedly recommend California Olive Ranch brand olive oil. I like to use their Global Blend for cooking and their California Blend for drizzling. This isn't sponsored, but they do make a great product that I actually use. When our oil is heated, let's toss in 8 ounces of roughly chopped mushrooms and a pinch of salt. And you always want to chop your mushrooms a bit bigger than the size you want to serve them because they'll lose about 50% of their volume during cooking. As soon as the mushrooms have given up their liquid, they're basically ready, but what Gordon does, as seen in this video, is to add a knob of butter, a couple sprigs of thyme, and a couple smashed garlic cloves to the pan in the last few minutes of cooking. This allows the butter to infuse with the thyme and garlic and will give the mushrooms an additional level of flavor. Then after the cooking, let's make sure to taste and adjust the seasoning. For the risotto, let's start by heating up some olive oil in a large pan over medium heat. Traditionally, you would use shallot as the base of a risotto, but I was only able to find shallot at a couple of Walmarts, so we're going to use onion instead. And we're aiming for a very fine dice, or what's known as a mince, so you want to try to get your onion to be around the size of a grain of rice. There is nothing worse than eating risotto and biting into a piece of crunchy, undercooked onion. So let's add half a minced onion to our olive oil with a pinch of salt and saute it until it has just turned translucent. Cooking a vegetable until it is softened but before it's gotten any color is called sweating. And the purpose of this is to soften the vegetable and to concentrate and draw out some of its flavors. In the case of onions, we're cooking out a bit of the raw acidity and sharpness and bringing some of the natural sweetness to the forefront. After a couple of minutes, when the onion has turned translucent, let's toss in a cup of arborio rice, and we'll gently stir this for a couple of minutes. In Italian, this step of sautéing the rice with shallot or onion in a cooking fat is known as rosolare, and you'll know the rice is ready for the next step when it is turned mostly translucent with maybe just a splotch of white in the middle. Then let's deglaze our rice with three quarters of a cup of dry white wine, and you don't have to break the bank. 
just use a crisp, dry, inexpensive white wine. Traditionally, Italians would use something like Pinot Grigio, but Sauvignon Blanc also works well. If you're gonna use a Chardonnay, which also works great, try to find an unoaked version because they're much milder and more appropriate for a dish like risotto. And let me let you in on a little secret. I've worked in some really nice restaurants and we all used boxed wine like this in our cooking. In the industry, we called it card Bordeaux. So if you're not a wine drinker and you don't wanna spend a lot of money, just grab one of these. I guarantee you they're using something like this at your favorite restaurant. And while the wine is cooking off, you should be able to smell the alcohol in the steam. So you'll know it's time to start adding the broth when the wine has completely evaporated and you no longer smell alcohol. Then we'll start adding our stock ladle by ladle. In Italian, this step is known as cucciere. And here I've got three and a half cups of chicken broth, but if you wanna keep it vegetarian, a vegetable stock also works well. The type of liquid you use is traditionally determined by the garnish of the final dish. And chicken broth works really well with the meatiness of mushrooms. And I know there's a lot of debate online about whether or not to just add all the liquid at once. Surprisingly, that method does work fine, but I still think there's some utility in learning how to make risotto in the traditional manner. And this is the way Gordon makes his, so that's what we'll be doing for this video. And you don't have to keep your broth boiling as a lot of people think. You just don't want it to be cold. Risotto is traditionally made with warm but not boiling liquid. I also see a lot of chefs online saying you can cook risotto in 20 minutes. To be completely honest, it usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes from beginning to end. But from the first addition of the broth or stock, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes. And you'll just keep adding the broth ladle by ladle, letting it reduce until there's almost nothing in the pan before adding the next spoonful. And you'll know it's time to add more liquid when you drag your spoon across the rice and it's just barely sticking, but you can still see some trails from the broth. You're basically just looking for the liquid to be almost totally absorbed. You don't have to constantly stir, but you do wanna make sure your rice is not burning on the bottom of the pan. And when you've added the last of the broth, you only wanna reduce it just a bit. You always wanna end your risotto just a bit soupier than how you're going to serve it because it will continue cooking and absorbing more liquid when you've taken it off the heat. Also, when we add the Parmesan at the end, it will absorb some of the broth. When you shake the pan from side to side, it shouldn't be watery, but it should look like a wave going back and forth. This is known as onde in Italian, which means waves, and this is the ideal consistency of a perfectly cooked risotto. Now we're gonna take it off the heat, cover it, and let it rest for about 60 to 90 seconds. Always add your fats off the heat. You don't wanna add butter and cheese while on the heat because they can split if it's too hot and it will make your risotto very greasy. After it's cooled down just a bit, let's toss in a quarter cup of our Parmesan cheese and three tablespoons of good butter. I was a bit worried we might have to use Kraft, AKA the people's Parmesan. This is the sort of cheese you might get in a former Soviet bloc country in exchange for a ration card. It's pretty bad, even by communist standards. But I was able to find this fairly decent Parmesan in the deli section of most of the Walmarts I visited. It's pretty good. So if you could find this, I'd grab it. And for the butter, risotto is the one dish I would advise that you spring for one of the good ones. Something like Plugra, Kerrygold, or even Land Lakes. Because we're using butter as a finishing flavor, the higher fat content of a nicer butter really does help all the other flavors shine through. And you'll just wanna gently whip the Parmesan and butter into the risotto. In Italian, this step is known as mantecare. In English, I've always heard this referred to as creaming. And with this, what we're doing is emulsifying the butter and cheese into the risotto. This is gonna add a lot of flavor and creaminess and enrich the final dish. And after the creaming is done, you'll gently fold in the mushrooms, making sure to reserve some to garnish the final dish. Then give everything a taste and adjust the seasoning with extra salt. If you like pepper, you can add some at this step, but remember, you don't always have to automatically add pepper to everything. Pepper has its own flavor, and with a dish like risotto that's very subtle, I like to keep mine as simple as possible to let the flavor of the rice and garnishes really shine on their own. Then to serve, you'll just wanna gently tap the bottom of the plate to spread out the risotto evenly. The most common term I've heard to describe the consistency of a properly cooked risotto is that of lava. And if you've done it right, it should gently spread out on the plate. Then you'll garnish with a bit of the reserved mushrooms and some finely minced chives. I was able to find both chives and parsley at almost every Walmart I visited, so just grab whichever one you like the best. And quickly, before our taste test, I wanna give you a pro tip. I know a lot of you are thinking, this is a lot of work just for a simple dinner. How are they able to serve this at restaurants when the cooking times are so long? What we do is cook the risotto about 90% of the way, then just before the addition of the final bit of broth, we'll take the rice and spread it out on a baking sheet, we'll let it cool down completely, then cover it and store it in the fridge. Whenever we get an order of risotto, we'll grab the amount of rice we need, toss it in a pan with the final bit of broth and heat it up. Then we'll finish the dish with the creaming and garnishing steps. This way we're able to finish each plate in about three to five minutes instead of the regular 20 to 25 minutes. 
And if you do this at home, the rice will last in the fridge for about two days without any noticeable loss in quality. Now, let's give it a taste test and see if we can avoid Gordon screaming at us. I know risotto gets a bad rap because a lot of people think of it as some sort of fine dining dish that's impossible to prepare correctly, when in reality, it's very simple comfort food. It's just that sometimes simple things are often the most difficult to do properly. So I hope I've shown you today that it is totally possible to make a world-class risotto, one that would even make Gordon Ramsay proud with readily available budget ingredients. And if you'd like to learn how to make Gordon Ramsay's legendary beef wellington with ingredients you can find at any Walmart, be sure to check out this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.